Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's presentation of Beyond Words from the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills, California. My name is Mark Slavkin, and I'm privileged to serve as Director of Education at the Wallace, as we affectionately call it. Our organization was given an amazing opportunity by the city of Beverly Hills to reimagine a historic post office building and create a center for the performing arts. And we did that beginning our new life as an arts organization in 2013. The Wallace presents and produces work in theater and music and dance and film and has a robust commitment to arts learning that we call Grow at the Wallace. Today's program, Beyond Words, is under that umbrella, Grow at the Wallace. It's an opportunity to bring together older adults to explore and share their personal stories, both in words and writing and speaking, and as the title suggests, beyond words in collage or photography or inspiration from music. Um, these programs that support older adults have been more important than ever during the pandemic, when I think we're all feeling more isolated and are really desiring that chance to connect with peers and be part of a community. So each of the classes that we offer, in addition to teaching skills, um, really becomes its own community. And that's made possible by the magic of my colleague, Deborah Pascarette, who both envisioned and designed the classes and has been teaching them. Um, and so it'll be my pleasure to introduce her in just a second. Before I do that, I want to introduce a new colleague, Victoria Kemsley, who has been an alumna of one of these courses or some of these courses, and has now joined our team on staff supporting Deborah and will be leading her own courses in the future. So thank you, Victoria. And with that, let me welcome to our virtual stage, my colleague, Deborah Pascarette. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for spending a little time with us today. I can promise you the next uh, half an hour or so is going to be enjoyable, poignant, um, kind of covers all of the, the emotions in the stories that you're going to hear today. The writers in this group have been incredible. And this course, as Mark mentioned, Beyond Words, is not just the writing of the pieces, but also creating visual pieces that go with their writing. Now, most people, I guarantee you, if you ask them in this class, will say they're not artists. And the great thing is, is you don't need to be an artist to be part of this program. But the truth is they really are all artists because what they're doing is they're thinking about things that create, that generate creativity and to go along with their stories to help lift their stories up and tell their story. So you'll see today, in addition to them speaking, you'll also see their artwork up on the screen. And they've chosen the stories that they're going to read today. Over the course of the last 10 weeks, they've created many stories and pieces, but they personally chose the story that they wanna share with you today. At the end of the reading, we will have a very short Q&A with our writers. So if anything comes up for you that you'd like to ask them, just hold on to it in the back of your mind and I'll be able to facilitate your questions at the end. So, I'd love to get started with our first storyteller, Paula Nicholas. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for leading this unique and really fun class. My story today is My Rocking Horse. Hi. Hello, I'm down here. Can't you see me? I'm making my arms as tall as I can. Oh, for heaven's sakes, don't you see my little fists blinking open and closed? Pick me up. Finally, scooped up and settled securely on my mother's extended hip. This is much better. 
Now I can play with that funny toy on mom's ear. I think that's a strange place for her to keep it, but I can reach it better now. I love days like this, listening to grown-ups talk, grown-up talk. I like the nights too. The nights are so quiet. Do you want to know a secret? My rocking horse is my best friend. He likes to go for rides after everyone has gone to sleep. I think he wants to go for a ride now. The tricky part for me is getting out of my bed. There are tall wood posts all around me, but I can do it. I'm very, very quiet as I tiptoe down the hall to the family room. My horse tries to be quiet too. I think that horseback riding is really fun. The only sound in the whole house is his whinny. It sounds like squeak, swish, slide, snap. Squeak, swish, slide, snap. Squeak, swish, slide, snap. Shh. I hear another sound. Footsteps. Then the light explodes all around us. And there they are, mom and dad, with tired eyes and wobbly lips. Looks like they can't decide if they want to smile or not. I look back at them with wide blinking eyes and stop rocking. I quickly dismount my rocking horse and walk back down the hall to my bedroom. Mom and dad are following me. When we get back to my bed, I'm lifted high up over the railing and plunked down for the night. Lights out. Waiting, waiting, back over the railing, down the hall, squeak, swish, slide, snap, squeak, swish, slide, snap. Thank you, and I am very pleased to present our next storyteller, Cheryl Collin. Thank you, Paula. Well done. I'm Cheryl Collin, and on display is a map of the neighborhoods that I lived in for my first 12 years of life. My piece is called Moving On. I learned, as I often did, coming home from school to see our car with a trailer hitched behind, doors open wide, the back seat legs, leg space packed with clothes to make a large bed. I stared down at the books in my arms, dog-eared favorites my teacher had lent to me. I asked mom if I could run back to the school to return the books, but she just shook her head and said we needed to hurry. I was angry with my stepfather, David, who kept us constantly moving from place to place. I tried to steer clear of his bossy finger as I loaded boxes into the trailer. It took us two and a half days to get to Arkansas, sleeping in parking lots along the way, David trading handles on the CB radio the whole time. Outside of Albuquerque, we talk, he talked with a trucker who offered to give my sister and me a ride. We met the bushy bearded stranger in a smoke-filled diner. Debbie refused to go, but I was encouraged by David's smiles. For once, he was acting as though he liked me, said I was a big, brave seven-year-old. So I went along, pulling the handle of the booming truck horn, which got David and the trucker snorting back and forth into the CD. After that, I felt a little weak need and asked if I could go back to my family. I was relieved that the trucker radioed David right away. David's mother was a tiny woman who'd raised 11 kids in her small house. I was surprised to learn that David was the youngest. Each morning, we were sent outside to explore the 20 acres. My sister and brother played catch one day with a red vegetable we'd never seen before. My brother screamed when he touched his fingers to his eyes, and even more when mom held him under the hose to rinse them. 
we learned to steer clear of hot peppers. It was my turn to scream. The humid afternoon and I fell asleep under a tree and an anthill and woke up with my head teeming with red ants. David slumped on the couch all day, turning into his mean old self again. He and mom started to fight about him going to the bar every night and not working, their usual fight. Soon, one of David's brothers came by and told him it was time for us to move on. For the first time, I realized he wasn't as powerful as I thought. The next morning, mom and dad carried our stuff out into the field, unpacked boxes of clothes and towels, books, and a box that I knew held toys. I wondered what they were doing until David brought out the can of gas and started to pour. They said we had no money left for another trailer. He lit a match and soon I could feel the heat of the blaze against my face. I squeezed my eyes tight, determined not to cry. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the multi-talented Karen Basulis. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, my equally multi-talented friend. I'm Karen Basulis, and today I will be sharing with you my earliest memory. It is a late afternoon in my old rickety house, and I am sitting in the yellow kitchen in my yellow bouncy chair, bouncing up and down and laughing. Up and down, up and down, giggling uncontrollably. It never gets old. The old farm kitchen table holds pride of place in front of me. And above the wall, above that, the wall covered in wallpaper with pictures of fruit and herbs rises up what seems like a hundred feet. Some years later, in homage to Simon and Garfunkel, my friend and I would diligently search for parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. It made me proud that in my otherwise embarrassing old shack, there was such a fine example of current pop culture on its faded and greasy kitchen wall. My grandfather, home from the ranch now, as we called our apple orchard, walks by me on the way to his room and hangs his cane carefully on the hook above my head. He looks down and smiles. Kakosi mala draga moya, he says to me in Croatian. How are you, my dear little one? He puts a bucket of fruit on the kitchen table, an invitation to my mother to turn it into pie or cobbler or jam. I'm not sure what fruit it was exactly, but it wasn't apples. I know that. This was summer. And the fruit from the apple trees was not ready yet. These could have been ripe and plump and blushing apricots or peaches or Santa Rosa plums or sweet little cherries from the trees at the back of the ranch at Orchard's End that were there just for us. Apples were the family business. Oh, we got those at home too, plenty of those. But the bounty from the stone fruit trees at the back of the ranch at Orchard's End, past the red delicious trees and the golden delicious trees, past the big makeshift barbecue where we held many a 4th of July cookout, past the bellflowers and the Newtown Pippins and perched just at the base of the golden oak covered hill, just as it started to ascend. Those were all for us. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the next storyteller, the wonderful Elaine. Thank you, Karen. I love that story. And my story is entitled That Time Again. I could hardly sleep the night before. 
The station wagon was washed and ready to go. We were ready for the trip downtown to that sweltering summer day to LA Union train station. It had already been two years, but it was that time again. We all followed mommy into the cavernous station and waited. The loudspeaker filled the air. Train arriving from Muscatine on track six. Seemed like days, but then all of a sudden, we saw her. Bright pink hair, rhinestone glasses, a swirl of color. There she was. Poof. She, she was preceded by a red cap who was pushing a big metal cart with two steamer trunks and the giant box. Yep, there it was, that box, the one we were all waiting to see. My two sisters and my two cousins ran to greet her. Hard to see what she was wearing, that flowery skirt that sometimes she wears. She was a little person, brown, like a dumpling. We followed her high-pitched cackling laugh. The season of Grandma Birdie had started. After the screaming and kisses, we piled back into the station wagon with the steamers and the box in my aunt's car. We were headed home for the ritual. My dad and uncle dragged the cardboard box up our stairs and plopped it in the middle of my sister Kay's bedroom. Daddy carefully pulled the heavy tape off each section of the box. Grandma Bertie peeled back the top and we all squealed. Okay, kids, go gentle, Grandma Bertie said. We dove in and found our favorites. Pick two things you want, but be sure and save some for your cousins. Scarves, sweaters, purses, jewelry, sweet smelling perfumes, handkerchiefs, fluffy blouses. This ritual was all part of Grandma Bertie's shopping spree from Muscatine to Chicago, Illinois, where she bought the prettiest things in various sizes. It's sure to fit one of my grandkids in California, she always told the store clerk. Hmm. Grandma Bertie was really something. But most of all, she was an inventor. Yes, inventor. She started the Bertie Guide. B Y R D I E, capital B Y E. It was a built in car seat bed for infants. Well, a mother of nine kids, she knew she needed a safe place in her big convertible. She had to secure that youngest of her brood. You know, she actually had two registered patents, and she made several trips to Detroit to market her invention during the late 1950s. Detroit was really interested, but they weren't ready to put the birdie by in their shiny new cars. They suggested selling it as an accessory that parents could buy. But Grandma Birdie would not settle for that. She wanted it in every car that rolled off the assembly line. It would be 1968 when Ford Motors introduced the child restraint infant seat. It was the beginning of the car seat as we know it today. Grandma Bertie always believed that someone was going to steal her idea. And no one could argue that. <gasps> the season of Grandma Bertie was magical. Those seasons stopped in 1964 on New Year's Day when she was celebrating her 49th wedding anniversary in Rome with Grandpa Ori. She quietly passed away in a hotel room of a heart attack. But her magic lives on in each of her grandchildren, great and now great, great grandchildren. Thank you. And now it gives me real pleasure to introduce our next storyteller, the lovely Linda Singer. Thank you, Elaine. Love that story. Hi, I'm Linda Singer, and my piece is entitled Come Winter. 
bare limb trees mourn the loss of each leaf fallen in winter's grip. The touch of rough barked oak, no comfort as I trod forward. I keep my head low to avoid the freezing gust and I push my body against this season of aging. Though I'd like to stop and rest, there's no time nor place to park myself and to stall the coming cold. This mud frozen path well defined by the footprints my ancestors have left. Some were soldiers, World War I, World War II, gone with their uniform smiles. Gone to those who went to Vietnam, never came back. Gone the mothers who died in childbirth and the babies taken by the common cold and the cousin whose shotgun blast blew his heart from his broken chest. Gone also are those who just packed up their belongings and their memories and their secrets and left. Scarred and scathed, I prodded many a previous season. <laughs> Springs of learning life's ways, how to get around them. <laughs> Falls of... <sighs> Summers of work and bills and making and taking and giving up and coming back. Falls of learning how to be satisfied and when to stop. And now with winter's approach, I've arrived at, at the edge of this unknown wood where snow covered and bundled up. I'm in search of a, a warm place to rest, to rest. To rest while I await the rise of a full wolf moon. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our next and final guest, all the way from Dallas, Texas, Richard. Thank you, Linda. Fly the friendly skies of Zoom. My name is Richard and my story is called October. Summer in the rear view mirror, winter in its time. The brief fortnight or two of perfect fall weather. A season in and of itself. No more sweltering heat and the freezing cold marching like the white walkers inexorably to town has not yet arrived. The Rusty Parrot Lodge in the heart of legendary Jackson Hole, Wyoming, they kept a light on for us. A magnificent ultra-modern two-story wood and stone luxurious cowboy bunkhouse with floor to ceiling windows a 1500 bottle wine cellar, a world-class spa and a gourmet chef driven restaurant. Not to mention the lovingly restored, dazzlingly pristine 1952 Red Ford F100 pickup that never moved from the side of the building. Fireplaces and wool Pendleton blankets kept visitors as snug as a bug in a, well, a wool Pendleton blanket, toasty through the night. Roll out of your king size bed in the morning for a Snake River raft ride, or head in the opposite direction to hike or to ski the Grand Tetons, or bisect those tangents and drive 30 minutes to Yellowstone National Park and set your watch by Old Faithful the most famous of all the park's natural geysers. The friendly native Jacksonians would always have a man versus beast cautionary tale to tell. 
to hopefully instill respect for the animals in their natural habitat and to prevent a tragedy. Real life encounters. You can check their ER records. For instance, do not put your young child on the shoulders of a seemingly docile bison for a presidential-like photo op. Bison have, not surprisingly, if you really think about it, been known to react to this intrusion in virtually every instance by bolting and throwing the child off, even turning back to inflict more damage than mere trauma. And moose rule number one, do not approach a female moose with a calf in tow. Moose rule number two, consider any moose without antlers that you see to be a female with the calf. And moose rule number three, don't forget moose rules numbers one and two. And even a tenderfoot greenhorn knows by now to not feed the bears. So there you have it, the bison, the moose, and the bears, grizzly and brown, the Mount Rushmore of the don't fuck with the animals category. A beautiful fall Wyoming morning provided the perfect time and reason for a sightseeing drive. On the Snake River Road that slithered S-hook shaped as it traced the base of the Grand Teton Valley. We stopped at a turnout for some back to nature moments and to shoot some we were there pictures. A young couple trying to look like they belong to the land and their miniature schnauzer were admiring the majestic mountains. Well, the dog was actually admiring the valley's wild shrubbery. Nature calling. <laughs> The couple excitedly told us they heard that moose were frequently spotted in the thickets below. And so they set out, the schnauzer leading the way, down the hill. I don't think that's safe or smart, I yelled after them, to no avail. My wife, Lynn, irresponsibly adventurous as usual, set off in hot pursuit. Then hanging back for a brief moment, she turned and said, come on, I wanna see a moose. Nothing's gonna happen. You know how dangerous my words hung in the crisp mountain air and yet again fell on deaf ears. Instantaneously, calculations of current and future iterations coursed through my brain follow Lynn to the valley floor in search of a moose and perhaps encounter one, then what? Or safely hang out here and never ever outlive what would be the constant and accusatory reminders of my reluctance or worse, cowardice. I ran to catch up to everybody, all caution thrown to the wind Chivalry is not dead, it's just stupid. This was not a quiet group either. Four people and one dog, tugging and peering through the branches, childishly and foolishly calling, here moose, the dog barking occasionally. I was envisioning an after lunch, napping moose, groggily rising hugely out of the dense brush trampling the dog and then charging one of us. I was quite confident I could outrun the women, but I just didn't want to have to prove it. I prayed that Moose could not smell fear. And then I see one, whispered the other guy in the hushed reverential tone of the TV announcer at the 18th green of the masters. The left side of my brain screamed, let's get out of here. Instead, the others, and yes, eventually even I, all crowded around the tiny opening in the branches. And there it was, the chestnut brown rump of a moose. The rest of it 
still too well camouflaged to be seen in its totality. Either asleep in a flora-induced coma, or it had already scared the shit out of a tourist today. It's quota met. Still, this was an official sighting. Mission accomplished. I somehow convinced Lynn we were pressing our luck. Most likely, like the hummingbird she is, she was just ready to move on. I thankfully guided her away and up the path to safety. I didn't hear any screams, so I assumed the other folks and their dog were still okay. Twixt September's heat and November's gate to winter, October falls best. <laughs>